CLWR was originally created in 1946 to address an immediate need to help fellow Lutherans whose lives were turned upside down as a result of the Second World War. Communities throughout Europe were devastated. Cities, towns, and rural areas destroyed. Food and fuel shortages made life intolerable, and most people were either homeless, unemployed, or both. Canadian Lutherans were compelled to help their family and friends across the ocean. Germany was in total chaos, and we had some distant relatives here in Manitoba, and they were basically responsible for sort of sponsoring me to come over to Canada, and in about 1948, they got in touch with Lutheran World Relief Association, and finally got the papers and whatever was required. And from there on, it's history for me. Next thing I know, I was on the boat on the way to Canada. When the war ended, the Canadian government approved the formalization of an organization to address the needs of civilians devastated by the conflict. And Canadian Lutherans joined together to create CLWR. didn't really want to come to Canada, but I have an uncle here uh, who came either 20s or 30s, probably in the 30s. He couldn't have come in the 20s, I would have made him too young, so probably the 30s. Mm -hmm. And he had, I mean things were really bad in, in Germany after the war obviously, so um, he wanted us to come. Uh, the way I understand it, mom and dad did not want to come to Canada, but my uncle that was my dad's brother, sent the ship's passage. Hmm. And so they felt that, well, you know, here we are, we're getting a free ticket pretty much, so let's go. Okay. <laughs> and so that's why we came. Making this decision to immigrate to Canada what wouldn't have been that hard a, hard a choice. They had nothing to lose. My mom and her family had lost everything at least twice, once in the Soviet Union and then again in East Prussia. My dad, on the other hand, came from the Schleswig-Holstein area. His losses were of a different kind. He had been in the Luftwaffe and later, after a crash and a long recovery, was sent to the Eastern Front, where he was taken captive and spent five years in a Soviet POW camp. After his release, he discovered that his former wife had not heard from him, and so she was in a new relationship. With both their young children dead of starvation, they decided to divorce. So when my parents met and married, they decided coming to Canada to start again. They were really, truly starting again. The, the trip cost $400 per person, and it took 10 days from Bremerhaven to Quebec City. And there were nine to 12 beds in a room, three layers of bunks, women and men separate. Um, no windows, barely any walking room, stifling, seasickness. She remembers two young women who were chewing on some kind of green herb and they didn't get seasick and she still wonders what that was. <laughs> okay. Uh, my parents took work as farm laborers near Morris, Manitoba after they arrived in Canada. And in the fall they moved into the city and my father worked on construction projects. Um, although the relatives, they would have these big reunions. that They had a big family reunion for their 50th anniversary, 50 years in Canada. I was too busy to go. But now when I look back, I figure, man, I had to be a certain age to really appreciate who my parents and my family were. Mm -hmm. And I'm now, now I'm there, but they're not here anymore. So. The voyage was terrible because we came in the middle of November, or actually, yeah, pretty much the middle of November, and the waves were probably 50 feet high, and the ship was only um, 8,000 tons, so it's not a big ship on waves like that size. So it, uh, it was, I know my sister and uh, my mom, they were sick for nine days. Um, Fortunately, I only got sick once, and uh, that was it. Accommodations were not very good. We uh, slept in bunks that were three high. The men were at the front of the ship, so it was going up like an elevator. 
and the women were in the middle, so they kind of just rocked, but they, most of the women were sick. I don't think I saw more than 50 people on deck at any one time, even though there were in the neighborhood of 700 people on board. But uh, the one thing I remember is ooh, the metal bumping your head against the metal. There were only these cutouts yes. to go from <laughs> one place to the other. And you were always rock, uh, going from one place to the other and I bumped my head against the metal. I was always afraid, oh, well, all metal, metal, metal. Since then, I guess I wouldn't want to live in a place with metal furniture all over. You know, just <laughs> <laughs> and the tables were bolted to the floor and the benches yeah. where you ate, you know, they, so you wouldn't shift around. Yes. Yeah, but I was sick too, eight, eight days. I, I know I was sick for eight days. I know my mother was sick, seasick, father too, I guess. Too bad my brother isn't here, he was four years old. But uh, seasick all the way, eight, eight days. The first, not the first day, not the last day, but in between most of the time. And then, but we would try to vomit over the railings on deck, you know, oh and it would blow back at you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we came over, we didn't speak any English. All we knew was yes and no. Sure. So uh, we landed up in my aunt's uh, place because we didn't have any place to go. So we stayed in the living room. I, I went to a uh, household to work for Jewish people, and my mom went in the sewing factory. My aunt got her job, and my dad was going in the bush with his dad. So we were scattered, you know, and he was going to school. But then after, I think, a couple of weeks, we found a place on McDermott to rent. So we were on the third floor, and we were very, very happy because we had our own place. But uh, yeah, we were also trying to save and learn English. Uh, at first, when they came, my mom was very upset. First of all, she didn't speak English. There was no job, and we were just didn't have anything, so she was upset. We're going to go back to Germany. We're going to save up money, and we go back to Germany. So, uh, But then we saved and saved, and I thought, OK, we cannot go with nothing. We have to save some money so that we can start something again in Germany. Uh, but then when we saved up, and then we said, OK, we got some money. We might as well buy a house. And that's how my dad went and bought the house. And we were happy. We kept on uh, going, and everything got better and better. And uh, we uh, just loved it. And my dad says, well, this actually my um, my, it was five years after, we got to go back to Germany. And myself, even I didn't speak very much English, but I thought, you know, I'm going to miss Canada if I go back again. Because I start to get used to this uh, country, you know, and it was nice for us. So mom let go and we stayed here and it was good. And yeah. it's good till now. Yeah. 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 What I remember most vividly is actually the, the trip across Canada. And we were in one of those older train wagons, which had wooden benches, and the windows weren't particularly tight. So as we were going through the prairies, so this is at the very beginning of April, 1951, uh, we were eating uh, dust all the time. So the winds were blowing, and it was you know, picking up soil from the fields, and they got in. So, yeah, no, it was obviously a very vast country um, in comparison to sort of the smaller West Germany, and then we arrived in a very hot climate when we came to uh, Pendikno, a very desert climate. It was very dry, uh, very, very unusual for somebody who had had most of his waking uh, uh, memory life in, in West Germany, and of course, almost like Britain, it's pretty green and, and lots of rain, etc., and so we didn't have that in the Okanagan at all. Mm -hmm. But it was very exciting, you know, everything from rattlesnakes to poison ivy to whatever else we encountered in the <laughs> first yeah. stages there. So, uh, so there were quite a few German Baltic people who emigrated together on the Beaver Bay in, in that year. So that's and that's the other part, you know, it's a, uh, adjusting to Canada was easier because we had a whole community. It wasn't just us. And then we had the church community. So in, in many ways we had sort of some kind of stability. But yes, there was an immigrant class with a teacher who knew some German. And so uh, we didn't go into regular classes till actually in the, um, you know, after the summer holidays. 
but we had it maybe a month, maybe uh, six six weeks or two two months. I can't quite remember. Uh, sort of trying to learn English, you know, and that was pretty funny in itself. Okay. Because all we figured all the pronunciations were all wrong, right? So we could because I, I could read. You know, I've been partially through grade one in Germany, and of course, you know, you know how to sound things out, and all of a sudden, all these sounds are supposed to be different. So it was it was quite funny, yeah. Mm-hmm. Initially, what you know, what separated us initially is, you know, because when we were at home at first, we spoke mainly German until we started school. Then there was more of a switch to speaking English on the part, even in the home, on the part of my parents. Um, so when you first kind of went to school, you struggled a bit. To, but once you got to know your peers, because we went to very small schools, uh, mine was in New Hazelton, sort of a two-room, sixth-grade school. And you got to know the people in the neighborhood, so it wasn't that difficult. Um, I think some, of, in some ways, the advantages were um, you learned in a way to be um, bicultural because you know the, you already had one language, had to learn another language, and uh, would hear stories of um, you know uh, refugees' experiences, war experiences. significance of sometimes even small bits of help along the way on their journey to, to get them to where they are. Sometimes we, we, don't, um, we don't quite grasp um, how important even small gestures can be. This is before the war had ended when my mother was um, trying to, and a mother, sister, and her mother, my grandmother, were trying to get on a train to get further west. And they were always, because my grandmother was rather frail, they were always being pushed aside by the mob. And my mother says one night, a uh, fellow came to them and said, you know, I've been watching you. There's going to be a train coming in 10 minutes. So get up and go to the platform and stand there, and I'll make sure you get on. And then the train came so they were able to get on. You know, so small gestures like that, um, he was just helping them and, and being empathetic, um, but my mom says chances are otherwise we would have never got on the train, and then life history might have been quite a bit different. Um, but uh, my mother would have been 30, my father 34, and you know, to, to have to start to rebuild your whole life in a way, that's, um, yeah, that's something that, uh, that I guess many of us haven't had to face. So, yeah. And sometimes we're not quite empathetic with that and I think that applies to what we're seeing today with refugees and, and their situations.